right, so first things first, we're gonna jump right into the seminar as promised. And what we're gonna do actually is I'm gonna have Mark come up here in a moment. So Mr. Mark Kennedy is joining us and he's actually a former United States Congressman, which I don't know about you, but that sounds quite impressive to me. Um, and he is so much more, but I always say, who better to tell you more about themselves than actually the person who's being talked about? So Mark, if I can ask you to come on up here, give a brief introduction and go right into the seminar, if you may. Thank you. Well, it's great to be back here at Globus. A uh, little bit about me. I have had the opportunity as a first generation college graduate to help Pillsbury buy a little company called haagen and bring it here to Japan. The treasurer of a company now known to you as Macy's. I uh, spent three terms in Congress and spent the last decade in academia. I've been president of both the University of North Dakota and University of Colorado. But I'm thrilled now to be at the Wilson Center. And the Wilson Center is a think tank in Washington, D.C. that is uh, in honor of President Wilson. Rather than build him a monument, they gave uh, money from Congress to help endow this think tank. And we focus only on international issues. I'm thrilled to be here in Japan with you today to talk about a topic that I think is the most consequential matter facing our collective peace and security. This has an impact on really every individual and every organization. To begin it and frame it, let me just say that when I was in Congress, I met, I met with Yang Jiexia, who's currently a member of the Politburo. And at the end of our meeting, I gave him a little carved loon, which is the state bird for Minnesota. And I say, we in Minnesota feel most peaceful when we're on one of our 10,000 lakes and we wake up and hear the, the sound of the loon echoing over the lake. And I told uh, Xi then, as I would tell him now, that my goal is that our two countries remain at peace. So that's the whole focus of what we're trying to achieve. A little bit harder today, perhaps, than it was in 2005 when I gave him the loom. What we're going to talk about today is, is both how do we get to the state of competition? Then what are the many competition domains that we're competing in? And what are the business implications for that before we turn and take a look at the future? But before we get into the path of competition, I want us to pause and think about that we face today, uh, never before in our lifetimes, have we had a challenge to the leading economy, the leading power in the nation like we do today. To put something in context, if you go back to 1970, when we were in the middle of, the, of our Cold War, the economy of the United States was two and a half times that of the Soviet Union. Similarly, when we were in World War II with Germany, our economy was two and a half times Germany. We, some of you may remember, uh, had a, what we call a Japan scare when we were worried that Japan was gonna overtake America. But even then, we were 1.4 times the size of the Japanese economy at that time. But if you look at today, in nominal terms, the American economy is just slightly bigger than that of China in purchasing power parity terms, we're a little bit smaller. So never before have you had two major economies in the world so close to each other in size and, and competing with one another. I would suggest that this is a century shaping event that will really impact the risk and the opportunities that face individuals and organizations for decades to come. And it's something we're pondering on. When you look also at the trading relationships, China now has, is the top trading partner to more countries than anybody else, including the United States around the world. This again is different for the peers that the United States has faced in the past. And after decades of sustained investment in research and development to get to the point where they're hoping to be the leading a global player in technology by 2049 when they have the century uh, of the PRC, uh, they are getting close to United States in many technologies. And looking at it militarily, in this chart, the green means uh, America's got a lead, the yellow means it's parity, orange means China's a lead. America is still the leading military power globally. But if you look at this narrow slice of just up in the Western Pacific, you see that China is beginning to get parity with us in many aspects. And in diplomatic terms, 
they're far more flexible and far more uh, sophisticated diplomatically than Russia ever was or Soviet Union ever was. You add that all together, and this is an unprecedented challenge that America has never really faced something like this before. But I want to give you a few reasons for optimisms going forward. As China struggles with availability of clean drinking water, America has four times as much drinking water per capita as China. In investment terms, we have 19 times more venture capital investments per capita than China. When you look at the brain gain that we get, this shows where the uh, tech students come from and what schools they go to and where they ultimately end up, you see that America, it's a very significant brain gain from China, from India, from Europe and elsewhere. And that helps us stay ahead on the technological front. When you look at the 100 largest companies in the world, 59 of them are American and much of the rest are from countries we consider allies. Interestingly, the further automation advances, the more that that benefits America and Japan and other high-tech co countries relative to those that rely on the benefit of low-income, low-skilled workers. So if automation advances in the high end, that would give us a more significant advantage over China. But the real important slide here is this demographic slide. Because if you look on the left and see China and line it up with the years below, you see that they were about to go into a multi-decade slide. The light blue is the working population and it's gonna be going dramatically down. You look at the big growth in, in uh, economy size that they had, in part driven by the huge run-up in the working population that they've had for the last several decades, but it's gonna be reversed going forward. Whereas you see on the right side with America, America has the best, most favorable demographics of any major industrialized country. So when you add this all up, it now has some observers saying that China may actually not get to be a bigger economy in novel terms than America. And if it does, it'll be short lived. Who knows? A lot of factors moving forward there, but there are reasons to be optimistic in the long term. How did we get from a state of cooperation to a state of competition? Well, you know, the apex of our cooperation was probably when we let China into the World Trade Organization. That was actually my first year in Congress to vote to let them in. And my hope, a lot of people's hope, was that by doing so that they would ultimately integrate in and align with the international rules-based order. Uh, but we found that in the minds of many that they bent or they broke uh, all the rules, whether it be having state-owned companies that had unfair advantages in markets, whether it be that they had national champions that they gave subsidies to or early market access to, whether it be vague laws that they would pass they used to discriminate against foreign companies, or most annoyingly, the forced tech transfer, localization, joint ventures, and the cyber IP threat step. Yeah, so you add it all together. And then we found in the South China Sea that they claimed a much more of the South China Sea than international law would justify. And then they built up some shoals and then a runway and then militarized it. The whole time they were saying that that's not what they were doing. And what we learned from that is that, uh, you know, they're playing a different game. This is me with a couple of my students watching a Go game in Beijing. And unlike most Western games where you have relatively straightforward uh, approaches uh, to what is winning and losing, and here you find that it's based on subtlety and deception and, and gaining relative advantage and encirclement. And we realize that's just what we saw in the South China Sea. And that when you compare that the salami slicing or, or the boiling a frog that you see that we've been practicing, that you, we found we needed to be a little bit more questioning of what we were actually here. We also found that in Hong Kong, where we had a relatively brutal reneging of the one country, uh, two systems, uh, and what we saw with the Uyghurs out in Xinjiang province. 
and then aligning with countries that uh, are not always friendly to America, whether that be they're getting close to Iran or the friendship without limits with Russia just before they went into their brutal assault in Ukraine. So you put that all together and it tells you, this is how we got from cooperation to competition. Now, what should our goals be in this competition? I would suggest, firstly, that we should always remain open to cooperation, even while we're in competition, uh, on things like climate change, nuclear proliferation, global pandemics, economic crises. Uh, Russia may, actually, me, China may choose not to participate, but we should always remain open to cooperation. There may be some that will be proposing these should be the goals, but I would suggest they should be questioned. Uh, the idea that somehow you're going to change China, uh, the idea that you should out China China by being you know mercantilist and coercive like they are, or that we used to have having friendly relations as a goal. We'd love to have friendly relations. Don't get me wrong, but when you say that's your goal, sometimes they use that against you in their salami slicing. Uh, also, you saw how connected they were around the world by being the leading training partners of so many people. A, a country that connected, the idea of containment seems a bit unrealistic to me. And when you look at how important this region of the world is economically, how aggressive they have been against Taiwan or the South China Sea, I don't think we really have the conditions for a detente. So I would suggest for our conversation here that our baseline goals be that we have sustained deterrence. And this has to be a multi-decade sustained deterrence. We're trying to deter aggression from happening. And we also want a world order that's rooted in our democratic values and cooperation, as opposed to authoritarianism and coercion. And what that all is said simply is a free and open Indo-Pacific. My guess is you've heard that before, you hear that again. And that's the collective focus that we in Japan have. So what are the many domains that we're competing in? Let's start with democracy versus authoritarianism. Uh, and this is important in that we'll have to be engaging a lot of countries that aren't necessarily democratic in this competition, but how democracy is perceived is important. Right now, uh, given that we have some election deniers in America and other things going on, uh, we've seen that in the Freedom Houses survey, we're in our 16th year in a row of slightly declining ratings of how democracy is doing. So this is a to-do list that we need to continue to work on. Another is the rules-based order. And we've seen both China integrate in with the rules-based order, but then trying to move it in their direction as they did with the International Trade Telecommunications Union to make sure that the rules that were written would allow for Huawei. Uh, but then they've also at times will create their own sort of international order with the Asian Infrastructure Investment Bank. Uh, a lot of people are saying that this international order created after World War II is really needing some updates to fit the current, the current uh, conditions. That's a much longer conversation, but it too is a very important domain we could beat. Then because the world order maybe isn't exactly what we need for today, alliances become increasingly important. And you've seen a lot of action on alliance just, just within the last couple of years. You've seen NATO put China as a systemic risk uh, for the first time in their mission state. You've seen NATO invite Japan, South Korea, Australia, New Zealand to their meetings for the first time. You've also seen the Quad, which uh, Prime Minister Shinzo Abe encouraged us to add India to a pre-existing arrangement between Australia, America, and Japan. And it's gotten more significant as we've had multiple meetings with the heads of state included in that. So that's an important alliance action in recent years. And the tighter alignment between Australia and the uh, United Kingdom and the United States with AUKUS uh, is an important alliance, particularly given how close the three countries are and how much experience they have in working together. But on the flip side, you also see China just recently with uh, Russia and a whole host of other countries on the 
post-doc uh, 2022 exercises. India was included as part of that. The good news is I understand that India wasn't in the maritime component near the islands of South Curl, but uh, they also have been working on bolstering alliances. Then we get to the disinformation. And we're in a digital age as we all are speaking to you here uh, in person, but also online. And there's been an increased action by China joining with Russia and other countries to try to foment divisions within democracies, pick at all the contentious areas we have and try to exaggerate those, as well as to in democracies or other countries try to under, you know, play up any fault we have with democracies and any benefit that they have. And they're also trying to undermine the Taiwanese a confidence in their own country. In the technology sphere, that's one of the main domains in which we're operating and competing. You'll find that when we have technological revolutions, they give an opportunity for a country to catapult into the lead. The UK became the leading economy in the world at its time when it came out of the steam first industrial revolution ahead. America became sort of the leading global economic power coming out of that second industrial revolution with Thomas Edison, electricity, and stayed in it in the third industrial revolution. What China is trying to do is they're working very, very hard to come out of the fourth industrial revolution ahead to catapult themselves into the lead. And if you look at the growth of research and development spending, they've been outpacing us, Japan, others, uh, for the last several decades, which is why you may have heard that one of the bills that was recently passed was called the CHIPS and the Science Act. And what you see here is at the inflection point, if we actually fund that, which I hope we do, a relatively significant increase in research and development funding uh, in the United States to make sure that we do stay ahead. We've also seen restrictions, as in restrictions uh, on, on exports, restrictions on investments in China and other restrictions. And uh, a recent report suggested that was criticizing our Department of Commerce for approving 94% of the applications for exports. Uh, and that having allowed an increase in the amount of semiconductor manufacturing equipment that we were sending to China. Uh, whole, pointing this out that an issue that's gonna get even more look by the United States. And intriguingly, China still uh, has 2.7% of the GDP that comes from electronic imports from US, Japan, and Europe, the same as they did when uh, Xi became the supreme leader. So he hasn't made much progress on this, but there's going to be increased action. As you may have seen just within recent days, the Commerce Department did not let NVIDIA have some of their high end chips reshipped to China. So I would suspect that you may see more of this in the future. On the digital security, that's increasingly important given how reliant we are in digital security. So you can imagine how shocked I was when back in 2018, when I went into the Piazza Navona, and this was the only advertisement they had on the whole Piazza in one of our allies, Italy. Now it's the phones instead of the back end telecommunications, but you're gonna find what you have in your back room for your telecommunications framework, as well as who you're using for cloud and how we're doing cybersecurity will become increasingly important in this competition. The military and space domains are clearly a key area of competition. Uh, when I brought my family here back in 2004, uh, we went to Yokota Air Base to have a holiday dinner with the, the airmen and women there and say thank you to them. So let me take this opportunity to say thank you to Japan for hosting so many of our bases here in your country. Uh, it is important to us and we appreciate it. America, despite the fact that we've got a pretty hot conflict going on in Ukraine, still when we came out with our national security strategy just recently, it said China is our patient challenge. So we're helping Ukraine with, uh, with their conflict with Russia, but China is still number one focus of the military. And that's being helped by Europe now beginning to step up to the 2% commitment of GDP spending uh, on the military uh, that has been the standard. And uh, we're also pleased to see that Taiwan had a fairly significant increase. But the article here notes 
that, that brings them up to 1.7%, uh, not the two or not to the 3.1% that America's at. And given that the hostile neighborhood they're in seems a, a little uh, different in question. And I think Japan found out even if you did not have US bases, you're still in the same zone as Taiwan. So this is an example of how there is support in America for uh, Japan stepping forward and having more significant support uh, for their military. But I think you'll also have to point out, we could talk about a number of domains militarily, but given that Russia has now aligned with China, remember Russia with the first person up in space, they have a lot of space skills, adding those long history of space skills together with China's rapidly increasing space skills, make them an increasingly competitive uh, party in space. And this is gonna be a more significant domain if there is any future conflict than it ever has been in the past. I have to call out one more area though, which is the nuclear area, because they've had a relatively strong run up in their nuclear capabilities. And if you remember for the last half century, uh, America and Russia have avoided having any conflict on a principle that we call MAD, the mutually assured destruction. But does MAD work when you have three players? Or does MAD work when we don't have the agreements with China that we have with, with Russia? Uh, so this is a cause for concern and certainly an area of competition. You've seen an increased use of sanctions. And I would say to you, even if the jury is still out on whether or not they're having the effect in Russia that we want them to have, in that US, Europe, and Japan have invested a lot more in China and lent a lot more to China, and China has invested or lent to us. Uh, trying to think that you're going to put sanctions on China without it being a big boomerang back on you is perhaps something you really ought to, to think about. So that may not be as much of a, of a tool to use. But important to business is supply chain. And, and that's getting increased focus. China has been for several years in what they call a dual circulation strategy. And a dual circulation strategy means that they want to be less dependent on others. As you see, the, their own content is stepping up in many categories and they're reducing their imports to imports from and exports to. Europe, Japan, and United States, at the same time that they make everybody else dependent on them, as you see is happening with the critical minerals and the rare earths. Uh, and you also see that we are very dependent on them for a lot of our electronic components. And the Economist the magazine did a study of 120 industries where they found that in two thirds of those, uh, China had a, over a quarter market share, and in a third of them, they have more than a half market share. So when China is rushing to be not dependent on us, uh, we have to be thinking about, can we afford to be dependent on them? What America is just beginning to realize is that all the people we consider friends are more dependent on China than we are. So if we really want to make sure that we're all aligned together with our allies, how our allies are dependent is becoming something that is a growing awareness and growing importance to us. But it's not just China, because Taiwan has used the strategy, given that they're in a very difficult predicament, to have everybody be dependent on them in, in the semiconductor. And what you'll find is with 61% market share, uh, that, that has to be a concern for us. So just recently, our, our Secretary of Treasury, Janet Yellen, was saying that we need to look to more diversify our supply chains. And you're seeing this be talked about more and more. You'll know that the Republicans tend to be against industrial policy and the fact that a number of Republicans voted for this CHIPS Act, which would provide subsidies to companies, which is not to their nature, tells you how important getting supply chain resilience is becoming in America. A key part of supply is energy. And when you look at energy, America is one of the leading, if not the leading producer of oil and gas, traditional energy, China is not. But then when you look at what China has been doing, 
this investments, the light blue is what they invested, each country or region invested in 2021 in, in sustainable energies. The dark blue is what they invested in, in, in traditional energies. And you see that China has a very dominant position in solar panels. And they've also invested more in wind in the last year uh, than uh, the rest of the world did in the last five years. So they're investing dramatically in sustainable energies, but you also see they're investing in traditional energies as well. Uh, the United States just recently passed, odd name for the bill that it ended up being, the Inflation Reduction Act, but it really had very significant amounts of incentives to expand our investment in America in sustainable energies. And you'll also see that America is shipping more of its liquefied natural gas to Europe, try to offset what's happened in Russia. But also, as you see in the chart, much of that is just Asian customers redirecting it to Europe. And a growing debate in America saying, should we just step up our LNG production so that we can help both of our European and Asian friends? The global South is an area of increasing focus. And when you think about the global South, uh, it came to our attention in great part when we had the UN vote on whether or not to suspend Russia from the Human Rights uh, Council. And so many countries voting no or abstaining, uh, you found, we found that they really have divided loyalties. This chart shows the world sized by the size of the gross domestic product. So even though there's a lot of people in Africa, South America, uh, Southeast Asia, you'll find that there's not a lot of GDP down there. So it hasn't necessarily gotten the attention. A recent study showed that America was the primary influencer for most of the world's democracies. China with Black says that Russia was their primary influencer, but red is China. And you see how so many countries around the world based on this study done by a fellow think tank uh, suggest that China was their top influencer. Uh, and what I'd like you to do is compare it with this chart where the blues are democracies and the oranges or reds are autocracies. And there's a lot of overlap between the autocracies being with China because we don't, uh, you know, we always have these things like human rights we care about that we're talking about. China doesn't bother them about anything like that. But also you find a lot of the corruption is much more intense in that part of the world. So this is a part of the world that if we want to engage, we have some challenges, but we can't give up on it. And we, US, Japan, and others need to figure out how can we have a more sustained engagement with them. Part of that might be through trade. When you look at trade, there's two dominant trade architectures in Asia, in the Pacific, the CPTPP and the RCEP. China's in one and wants to be in the other, America's in neither. And when you look at it, I put circles around the countries where America already has trade agreements. So we already have trade agreements with a good share of the country companies in the CPTPP. Uh, and most of the ones that we don't have relationships, you would think would be the ones that we would want to have relationships if we wanted to diversify our sourcing. So this continues to be an area of debate. We still have a, a, a political sensibility in America that makes it hard for us to move forward and trade, but uh, we'll continue to press this issue. And the degree to which there's become a little bit of a protectionist turn is seen in our little spat that we're having right now with South Korea over the bill, not providing for electric vehicles uh, coming from uh, Korea to get the incentive, which is being talked about at the highest levels. So hopefully we'll get resolved. So the main thing the Biden administration is doing on trade is moving forward with something called the Indo-Pacific Economic Framework, which was uh, put forth here. And that we're not allowing, they're not allowing any market access It'll be done with the presidential authority as opposed to the congressional authority. But when you look at the countries with, that I put the, the, the stars beside, those are all the countries that we're talking about with the IPAP. And so a big overlap. But also, we're also moving forward with a conversation with Taiwan about a possible trade agreement. Now, I say Japan's as important to us as Taiwan. Maybe we should add those to that list as well. 
And the sanctions that Trump put in place vis-a-vis -vis China uh, have still not really been rolled back. I'm still considering those. So trade continues to be a, a difficult topic for America, but one that is equally important and perhaps that we need to reconsider. And finally, in infrastructure. When you look at what China did in the One Belt, One Road is continuing to do, it really uh, suggests that we should be doing more. And that's why I'm pleased that the G7 and the Quad both came up and had commitments, but it's important that we follow through on those commitments. Uh, wow, that's a lot of competition. Uh, but what are the business implications? When you look at it, first, let's talk about lessons from Russia. The fact that we had so much write-off, so many people having to move, largely driven by public opinion, drop in sales at Renault, and then things like Russia not letting you sell. We also would like to say that be, perhaps you were having less optimism in China. This is a, a series of surveys taken by the US-China Business Council that shows the optimism about investing in China has been slowly declining. When you look at it just in the last three years, nearly everybody is less optimistic today than they were three years ago. You've seen this shows the collective investment that China's having in America, America's having in China, taking a relatively steep uh, reduction in recent years. And if you're using uh, portfolio investments as a, as a benchmark, they also have been declining. But I would, I would caution not to overreact because if we go back to our goals and we said our goal is deterrence, amongst the most important deterrence is having mutual engagement with one another. So let's not overreact, but let's not underreact either. Because in this world of dual use, uh, that your products could be used by the military, if your products have anything to do with what happened in Taiwan here recently, that could put your country company at risk. So uh, I would look at that. Also, if it's good for countries to reduce their overdependence, uh, it's also good for companies to have a diversification of supplies from suppliers or from the countries you're getting your supplies from. Many countries, because of this concern, companies, because of this concern, are focusing on vertical integration. Whether you've seen just recently, within recent weeks, Toyota and Honda LG announcing that they're going to invest in a battery plant. Or recently, Elon Musk says he's going to do a lithium plant to make sure that they have their own supplies. Uh, the other thing I would have you ask yourself, as the, communist, the Chinese Communist Party set your expiration date as a company, because they have a goal of making themselves independent of American and Western technology. So if you're a technology or financial services company, do they have in the back of their mind a date when they wanna have that be supplied by a Chinese company? And they've also had a fairly heavy hand in the economy here recently, which you see with the uh, no exceptions on COVID, that most of the companies that have uh, experienced negative impact of this and are thinking of reducing their investment. And also not very happy about the way that China is addressing governing information flows and technology security. And uh, may not be as comfortable with having uh, Communist Party sell as part of their company. So final thing I would just say is even with all this, you need to uh, deal with the compete conflicting pressures such as if you look at more than half of the, the half of those that, that thought that they had been influenced to either say something or not say something politically had seen that increase. Most of it comes from the Chinese side, but you're seeing a pushback from the US side as well. An example of that being Intel having to apologize for telling its suppliers not to go to Xinjiang province, or you're seeing with uh, the Nike and Adidas getting competition with Anta you know, being critical of them not being willing to source from Xinjiang province. And from a contingency perspective, you need to think about if there's more exercises that prevent the shipping lanes that you were using before, you have alternative shipping lanes you can use. So you also need to prepare for others to overreact. You shouldn't, but that doesn't mean others won't. And if you look at this survey, the majority felt that the number one issue they worried about was geopolitics interfering. You don't do surveys in China much, but if you look at politics as driving 
things on both sides of the Pacific. Here, it's it's a survey from 2012 as to should we get America out of the, is it important to get America out of the Western Pacific? Less than half the people think it's important, but a good share of the political leaders think it's important. On the other side of the pond, you'll see that there's increasing uh, concern and unfavorable views of China, most pronounced in US, Japan, Australia, and South Korea. Interestingly, still favorable views of China and Malaysia and Singapore. And that negative view has grown, not just during the Trump administration, but continues to grow in the Biden administration in America. You'll see that whatever party you're from, there's great concern in America about, about human rights. You'll also see a growing number of people in America viewing China as being a major threat. You'll see a much greater percent of Republicans that will view China as an enemy than Democrats and generally have a more uh, concerned view about China. And what it all adds up to is that even the dovish China watchers in America are becoming hawkish. So you might need to think about from a company perspective, if, when, what? When this is in the front page of the, one of the leading newspapers in America, you may need to, as a company, have a view on if China's gonna do something in Taiwan or something else that would create a major stir and a pushback, uh, when they might do that and what that might mean for your company. Uh, when I went to meet the president of Taiwan in 2005 as a congressman, I did not create a big stir like we are today. But now we find that if a, if you go to Taiwan, it's, it's a major news event. And political leaders like major news events. So, you know, what's going to happen if even a, a presidential candidate decides to come to Taiwan? What might that do? How might China react? The leader of one of our, our main think tanks thinks that we ought to move away from strategic ambiguity as to whether or not we're going to come to Taiwan's aid and move instead to strategic clarity as a, as a means of deterrence. If uh, a major political or presidential candidate uh, signs on for that, what might China do? And we've seen uh, some, you, know, you can always have a reckless accident, a blow out of proportion. And this is particularly concerning in that just recently, uh, China set aside the military to military communications, which is very dangerous to do. Uh, we went through the whole uh, Cold War with Russia. Part of the way we kept that from being hot was that we always had the communication channel military to military between the Soviet Union and the United States. So business implications, future path. I would just say that next month, you're gonna see Xi Jinping in all likelihood be getting his third term. Once he's got that, does he come out of that? Is he, is he more confident and aggressive or is he more restrained? We don't know. Uh, we do understand that he's going to be at two big meetings in November uh, with the G20 down in Indonesia, with APEC in Thailand. They will be meeting with, with uh, Biden, so we'll get some early uh, in indications of that. We hope that we're on a path where we can achieve the goals of strategic deterrence. But I would say no matter what happens, that this is one of my favorite photos I've taken in Japan at the uh, city in Odaiba of uh, a gift we got from France uh, replica. No matter what happens, uh, I'm uh, more optimistic because of the very close relationship that US and Japan has and how we both stand together and wanting to keep uh, freedom's flame uh, alive. So thank you for your attention here today. I look forward to our dialogue.